Dr. Raja Gopal, who I'm going to introduce. I'm really excited that she's speaking with us uh, today. Um, Amu joined the Division of Infectious Diseases and Global Public Health just recently, and she's been uh, she's been at UCSD now for two years. Uh, she completed a residency in internal medicine at Scripps Green and then a fellowship in infectious diseases and global public health at the University of Chicago. But then she came out to UCSD where she completed another residency in preventative medicine and a master's in public health with an emphasis in epidemiology. And she, was, uh, she started to work at the Owen Clinic at the same time and for those of us that have started to work with her, it's been really just a pleasure. And she's been such an awesome addition to our group. Um, she's really interested in understanding and addressing the social determinants of health disparities. Uh, and at the Owen Clinic, where she primarily cares for patients living with HIV, she also um, does hepatitis C and Cohen and sees. Uh, patients with hepatitis C and co-infection, as well as opioid use disorders. Uh, but today, she's going to talk about hepatitis C, and I'm going to pass it along to Dr. Rajagopal. Thank you. Can you hear me? You are good. Okay. Oh, and sorry. And just to, a reminder to people, you can either private message me or put it in the chat, um, and I will uh, try to save, we're going to try to save some time for some questions at the end. Sorry, go ahead, Amu. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, so my plan is to discuss the epidemi epidemiologic trends of hepatitis C infection, uh, ongoing elimination efforts, and an update on the evolving screening recommendations. So, so in the United States, uh, an estimated 4.1 million persons have evidence of past or current hepatitis C infection or test positive for the anti-hepatitis C antibody. 2.4 million people are estimated to have current infection based on testing with molecular assays for hep C RNA. The estimated prevalence of chronic hep C infection is estimated to be about 1% in the United States. And just to offer some global perspective, the World Health Organization uh, in 2015 estimated that approximately 100 million people globally had serologic evidence of hep C infection and 71 million people had chronic hep C infection. This is actually estimated to be a global prevalence of 1% um, as well. Locally, according to uh, San Diego County Public Health Office report from December 2019, nearly 54,000 individuals are estimated to be currently living with hepatitis C infection in San Diego County. So the costs of infection are tremendous and uh, preventable today. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention found that hep C related deaths surpassed deaths from all other reportable infectious diseases combined um, in the United States in the past decade. It's estimated that 50 to 86% of people infected with hepatitis C uh, develop chronic infection and liver disease. Five to 20% develop cirrhosis and one to 5% of infected individuals die, usually from complications of cirrhosis or liver cancer. Hepatitis C infection is a leading indication for liver transplantation in the United States and the leading indication worldwide competing with alcohol and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And in terms of economic costs, uh, the economic cost of chronic hep C in the United States was estimated to be around $6.5 billion and is projected to increase to $9.1 billion in 2024, the vast majority of costs uh, related to cirrhosis. So the arrival of direct acting antiviral therapies has created really a new opportunity for hepatitis C elimination worldwide. Uh, before 2011, the standard of care therapy for chronic hep C infection was the combination of weekly pegylated interferon alpha and daily doses of ribavirin in a 24, 48, or 48 week uh, course. Regimens associated with um, these regimens were actually associated with severe toxicities that frequently led to patients discontinuing therapy. Uh, direct acting antivirals 
by contrast, are well tolerated, usually completed in eight to 12 weeks. The goal of hepatitis C treatment is sustained biologic response, or SVR, uh, defined as the continued absence of detectable hep C RNA for at least 12 weeks after completion of therapy. And the SVR rates with uh, current regimens are also substantially higher, greater than 95%. Sustained virologic response is associated with a significant reduction in liver inflammation and fibrosis, and even resolution of cirrhosis in some cases. So the overall benefits include a 90% reduction in uh, liver-related mortality and liver transplantation, a greater than 70% reduction in the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, and patients who are cured of hepatitis C infection have reported a substantially improved quality of life. In terms of the public health benefits, successful cure ends transmission. Uh, recent models have shown that even modest increases in treatment of hepatitis C infection uh, particularly among people who inject drugs, can dramatically decrease the incidence of hepatitis C infection in our population at the national uh, level. So largely as a result of uh, these advances in treatment, goals have recently been established at the global, national, and local levels towards eliminating hepatitis C infection in the next decade to be accomplished by 2030. In 2016, the World Health Organization issued a proposal to eliminate hepatitis C uh, by 2030, specifically stating a goal of reducing new cases by 80%. In 2017, the Department of Health and Human Services published the National Viral Hepatitis Action Plan for the US, which also provides a framework for eliminating hepatitis C in the United States. <clears throat> in July 2018, um, California's uh, Department of Healthcare Services issued a new treatment policy for the management of chronic hepatitis C, <clears throat> which recommends treatment for all patients, except those with a short life expectancy that cannot be improved, rather than prior prioritizing treatment for those with advanced liver disease and uh, hepatic decompensation. And this was based on accumulating evidence that in patients with uh, biopsy-confirmed uh, metavir stage F0 or F1 fibrosis, survival rates are significantly uh, improved for those who achieve SVR compared to those who remain untreated. To date, however, several state Medicaid programs still limit treatment to beneficiaries with severe liver disease, as well as those most likely um, to uh, successfully complete treatment, such as those without drug and alcohol addiction, um, citing the high price of hepatitis C treatment for Im imposing um, these treatment re restrictions. California, uh, thankfully, happens to be one of the states with the fewest Medicaid um, restrictions. In uh, December 2018, the Eliminate Hepatitis C San Diego County Initiative, which was spearheaded by the County Health and Human Services Agency and American Liver Foundation, announced a mission to eliminate hepatitis C here. So uh, this initiative set the goals to reduce new infections by 80% and deaths due to hepatitis C in our county by 65% by uh, 2030 through increasing prevention efforts, expanding testing, and providing better treatment access. So where are we in terms of meeting these goals um, nationally? So in spite of the um, uh, development of curative treatment in the past decade, Hepatitis C infections have actually risen significantly and have more than tripled uh, nationally since 10 years ago. New cases, more than 65%, have occurred predominantly in um, white adults of, of the age group 20 to 39, uh, mostly in uh, non-urban areas. Hepatitis C-associated death rates have also increased in 15 uh, U.S. jurisdictions between 2017 to 2018. And this uh, recent um, epidemic um, is suspected of basically mirroring um, the epidemic of injection opioid drug use. Um, and this is based on um, national survey data where among cases that included risk information, 72% reported injection drug use, um, often preceded by the use of prescription oral uh, uh, prescription opiates. So while injection drug use is estimated to account for uh, nearly three-fourths of new infections today, 
Previously, transfusion of blood products was considered the major risk factor for infection with more than 10% of recipients acquiring hepatitis C infection. The prevalence of uh, hepatitis C antibodies in hemophiliacs who regularly received concentrates um, of clotting factors was 84 to 100% prior to screening. Uh, routine donor screening for hepatitis C antibodies, however, after 1990, and the use of treated or recombinant clotting factors has nearly eliminated uh, the risk of post-transfusion acute hepatitis C infection. And then nu nucleic acid testing, which allows for earlier detection, decreased the risk of transmission to less than one uh, per million. The evidence for previous birth cohort screening recommendations um, that changed very recently uh, included data from the National Health and Nutrition Examine Examination Surveys, NHANES, from 2003 to 2010, which found that approximately 80% of patients with chronic hepatitis C infection in, in the U.S. were specifically born between 1945 and 1965. So because earlier prevalence studies identified transfusion of blood products and history of past or present injection drug use as the biggest uh, predictors for hepatitis C infection, prior to March of 2020, um, both USPSTF and CDC recommended one-time screening to adults born between 1945 and 1965 and persons at high risk for infection. The risk factors included in both uh, recommendations were injection drug use, long-term hemodialysis, being born to an infected mother, and having exposures as a healthcare worker. The CDC also recommended screening individuals with HIV infection annually. Uh, the evidence for sexual transmission uh, generally was considered inadequate to recommend uh, routine hepatitis C screening based on sexual behaviors alone. Uh, the World Health Organization, European Association for Study of uh, Liver, um, National Health Service in the UK, Canadian Task Force, they all recommended similar risk-based screening uh, schemata, uh, which prior prioritized patients with injection drug use history and history of blood product transfusion, but deferred in specifications of additional um, exposures that warranted screening. So within the context of risk-based screening recommendations, approximately 50% of infected persons um, were estimated in the United States to be unaware that they were infected. And 45% did not report any uh, known risk factors for infection either when identified. According to a uh, recently published disease progression model from the European Association for the Study of Liver, even with the introduction of curative uh, therapies, the United States is not projected to eliminate hepatitis C infection until after 2050, unless the rates of diagnosis and treatment uh, dramatically change uh, course. But to make us feel better, if you can look at this uh, figure from uh, that publication, uh, 2030 being highlighted in green on the green axis, 80% um, of high-income countries, um, according to this model, are also not on track to meet hep C elimination targets by 2030. So in the summer of uh, last year, while I was working on completing a master's in public health degree in epidemiology, I uh, completed a research project at the San Diego County Public Health Department as part of the Eliminate Hepatitis C San Diego County Initiative. The purpose of my project was to identify predictors of infection in patients who presented to Rosecrans STD clinic from the existing medical record data. And one of the challenges to this research was data, col uh, data collection since the county STD clinics rely on paper charts and do not have an electronic medical record system. Uh, the county STD clinics uh, notably, however, serve a potentially more vulnerable patient population since fees for services can be wa are waived for patients who are unable to pay for services. And, and otherwise, the cost of a visit is $40. Um, no insurances are accepted. So the specific research questions I uh, was trying to answer um, using the patient medical record data. One, what percent of patients who are antibody positive or RNA positive and require uh, linkage to care? Uh, two, what are the socio-demographic predictors of being uh, antibody positive in the patient population? Um, how many infected individuals are aware of infection? And then are men who have sex with men more likely to be uh, antibody positive than men who have sex with women only, and uh, um, uh, which might need, suggest a need for prioritizing the subpopulation for, for screening and repeat screening. So to provide some rationale for that last research question, uh, the CDC 
uh, has recommended hepatitis C screening with antibody assays, uh, at least yearly in men who have sex with men who also have HIV infection, and more frequently, depending on specific uh, circumstances, such as community prevalence and incidence, high-risk sexual behavior, such as unprotected anal receptive sex, um, ulcerative STDs, and uh, proctitis uh, since 2015. But uh, routine screening has not been previously recommended for uh, general MSM population. Most studies that have examined uh, prevalence and risk factors for hepatitis C infection in MSM population have examined it in HIV-infected subjects. So in the multi-center AIDS cohort study, uh, 1984 to 2011, in which uh, 6,972 HIV-infected and uninfected MSM were prospectively followed for uh, antibody conversion, the hep C infection incident rate was nearly 8.5-fold higher among those who were HIV-infected compared to uninfected men after adjusting for behavioral confounders, including injection drug use. And uh, in a sy systematic review of 38 cross-sectional studies from 2000 to 2015 on the evidence of sexual transmission of hepatitis uh, C in men who have sex with men, the incidence was found to be very low in HIV-negative MSM, less than 1.2%, uh, similar to the general population. HIV co-infection has been associated uh, with more persistent hepatitis C infection, um, higher seminal and rectal fluid concentrations of hepatitis C virus have been identified and a higher risk of sexual transmission. Uh, behavioral factors such as serosorting or sex between partners of the same HIV status um, with the aim of minimizing transmission and increased rates of anal sex without condoms have been implicated in the higher rates that are seen in the co-infected population compared to uh, HIV negative uh, men who have sex with men. In the past year, five years uh, especially, however, there's been a handful of case reports and studies to suggest a silent new epidemic among HIV negative men who have sex with men. Um, in one study examining incident infection among MSM on PrEP uh, in Amsterdam, 2017, using phylogenetic analyses, all HIV negative MSM were infected with a virus that was found to be uh, strains that were circulating among MSM clusters uh, with, with men who had HIV. The uh, hepatitis C uh, infection prevalence among 375 HIV negative MSM on PrEP in this study was 4.8%, substantially higher than previously reported uh, in HIV negative MSM. Handful of case series have also suggested evidence of increased sexual transmission risk among HIV negative uh, MSM. So on the basis of these findings, the CDC recommended in its 2017 PrEP guidelines that MSM starting PrEP in particular actually should be considered for hep C. Uh, infection screening as a part of baseline laboratory assessment, repeat monitoring for infection among PrEP users, and uh, routine screening for sexually active MSM without HIV who are not on PrEP was not recommended. So certain sexual behaviors and practices in uh, men who have sex with men could be associated with a higher risk of hepatitis C infection. This is based, um, this information is based mostly on data from studies on HIV infected MSM, however, but risk factors have included unprotected receptive um, anal intercourse with multiple male sex partners in the past six months um, versus unprotected anal sex with one partner or less or unprotected sex as the insertive partner only. Uh, presence of ulcerative STIs, such as syphilis, lymphogranuloma venereum, herpes, and um, sexual behaviors that results in mucosal damage or results in exposure to blood, such as fisting, group sex, and chemsex, or the use of recreational drugs such as um, crystal meth during sex. So I also tested the hypothesis that being MSM is an independent risk factor for being antibody positive in the STD clinic patient population. The study had a case control design and compared uh, patient characteristics among antibody positive patients with those of antibody negative patients. The data set I analyzed was composed of information obtained from 192 uh, medical records at uh, Rosecrans STD clinic from patients who were screened um, between March 2015 to September 2019. 
Uh, notably, the providers at the clinic screened patients using the existing risk-based screening recommendations from the CDC. And uh, data was obtained from the charts of 96 antibody positive patients and uh, 96 antibody negative patients, uh, matched by uh, the time of a clinic visit. So most of the uh, data collected was obtained from self-report clinic intake questionnaires, uh, which included information on demographic characteristics, sexual behaviors, recreational drug use, um, hepatitis C infection awareness, and then the lab reports to confirm um, infections. Um, I did all the analysis using R, and um, in uh, my descriptive data summary tables, uh, Wilcox and Rank some tests for the to analyze differences in the continuous variables and Fisher's exact tests um, to compare categorical var variables. And uh, p-values were two-sided two and considered statistically significant was less than 0 0.05. Also did univariate logistic regression analyses to estimate odds ratios and corresponding 95% uh, confidence intervals between the uh, characteristics, risk factors, and past or present hepatitis C infection and um, viremia and unawareness of being uh, antibody positive. And then I did a multivariable logistic regression analysis which included the significant variables in the univariate logistic regression and also those variables that were not highly correlated with other variables um, to estimate the adjusted odds ratios for uh, re reported risk factors and past or present hepatitis C infection. So about 57.3% of the antibody positive patients were found to be PCR positive, uh, representing current infection. And then table one uh, here basically displays the characteristics of the subjects by antibody status. So the mean age of the antibody positive subjects was significantly older, approximately 45 years compared to 39 years of age for antibody negative subjects. Vast majority were male, ne nearly 85%, which was similar between the uh, two um, cases and controls. And uh, they had similar uh, racial and ethnic composition with the majority being white in, in both. Most men in the study population, 109 of 162 men notably reported being MSM. And approximately 41% of uh, MSM uh, in the study population had HIV infection. Anti antibody positive section, uh, subjects were also more likely to report being heterosexual and, and um, less likely to report being MSM. Um, all subjects that reported heroin use in the past 12 months were found to be hepatitis C antibody positive. Uh, Self-reported use of stimulants, prescription opiates, and poppers did not significantly uh, differ between the uh, cases and the controls. Uh, consistent with the results of the rest of the Fisher's exact tests um, that I didn't include, but here in the univariate logistic regression, I've included um, these variables, um, examining associations between uh, uh, characteristics and being antibody positive. So in order of descending odds ratio, being homeless, reporting a history of injection drug use, history of incarceration in the past 12 months, uh, having a sexual partner with injection drug use history, and high-risk birth cohort were the characteristics that were significantly and positively associated with being antibody positive in the uh, univariate logistic regression. Uh, being MSM was uh, actually significantly and negatively associated with being antibody positive in the univariate logistic uh, regression. In the multivariable regression analysis, uh, reporting a history of injection drug use and reporting being homeless alone uh, were the independent positive predictors of past or present hepatitis C infection. Reporting being uh, MSM was not significantly associated in the multivariable regression analysis. No significant associations with birth cohort, incarceration, or partner injection drug use uh, were demonstrated either with being antibody positive. So um, in other words, homelessness and history of injection dr drug use emerge as the only independent predictors um, of being antibody positive in this study population. So uh, I think while, while these results may not be all that surprising, I found it interesting um, that self-reported homeless status, while not listed as an independent indication in risk-based screening recommendations previously, you know, appeared to be the uh, predominant predictor for being he hepatitis C antibody positive among the patients that were obtaining services from the STD clinic, 
rather than uh, a self-reported history of injection drug use. Um, and uh, older national prevalence studies, which guided the screening recommendations, notably disproportionately excluded homeless individuals as study subjects. However, in the prevalence studies that have targeted homeless populations, they have been consistently found to have a higher prevalence of hepatitis C infection, with prevalence estimates of 22% to 53%. Uh, varying by region studied in the U.S. Uh, the association has been previously attributed to more in, uh, injection drug use and risky injection practices such as sharing equipment. Up to 70% of homeless individuals have um, reported a history of drug use disorder. So to explore the association I found in the multi multivariable regression analysis, <clears throat> I looked, explored a little bit more about the characteristics of the subjects separated by housing status for comparison. So zoomed in more on the same table, uh, homeless subjects were significantly more likely to report a history of injection drug use, 76% versus 20%, and incarceration in the past year, 37% versus 5%, uh, compared to subjects that reported being stably housed. Homeless subjects were significantly more likely to report stimulant drug use and heroin use, uh, having a sexual partner with injection drug use history, being a commercial sex worker and having sex with a commercial sex worker in the past compared to stably housed subjects. So even after adjusting for other significant risk factors, however, self-reported homelessness was independently associated in my analysis with being hepatitis C antibody positive. So one plausible reason, while it cannot be proven from my data, um, may be on reporting of drug use or particularly illicit drug, drug use. Uh, multiple studies have found a lack of concordance between reported substance use and biochemically verified use, particularly in patients that are not presenting for treatment of their substance use disorders. Lower socioeconomic status, history of incarceration, and mental illness have been associated with underreporting of uh, substance use. And threat of stigmatization or criminalization are, are potential reasons that have been um, cited. Illicit substances in particular have been found to be underreported at significantly higher rates than legal substances such as alcohol and cigarettes. Other potential important risk, uh, potentially important risk factors for hepatitis C infection that uh, may have also been excluded in the analysis based on the data I had available from the questionnaires would have been non-injection drug use methods, um, and potentially unrelated, unregulated tattoos or body piercings, um, especially with its association with incarceration and the large number of patients that were incarcerated in my study population. Um, but the former uh, 2013 USPSTF screening recommendations considered intranasal drug use as an indication for hepatitis C testing um, while not included in uh, previous CDC recommendations. Um, and, and that wasn't asked about in um, the surveys. Uh, hepatitis C RNA has been detected in pipes and sorting apparatuses and multiple studies have found an association um, with hepatitis C infection and individuals um, using illicit drugs often share equipment. Non-injection drug use uh, is also a risk factor for higher risk sex sexual behavior, such as having multiple uh, concurrent condomless sex partners, and higher risk sexual networks for both HIV and hepatitis C infection. Uh, CDC, IDSA, and American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases have also previously recommended hepatitis C screening for um, MSM with specific risk factors. So in terms of the findings that um, I, I found with the MSM population, uh, PrEP use was not explicitly asked in the self-report questionnaires. And um, this table shows the univariate analyses for characteristics in the MSM subjects and past or present hepatitis C infection. Only MSM with injection drug use was significantly associated with being antibody positive. So while higher hepatitis C infection rates among HIV infected um, men who have sex with men is well documented, in this study population, HIV infection was not significantly associated, but um, limited sample sizes of the MSM subgroups may have also reduced the ability to uh, detect statistically significant differences. Uh, also information about CD4, T cell counts, degree of HIV suppression, and immunocompromise were not collected from the HIV infected subjects.
And um, persistence of hepatitis C virus is correlated with lower CD4 T cell counts. Another limitation uh, may be that the cascade that is used in the, in the public health clinic, uh, which starts with antibody testing followed by RNA testing, that was implemented in all clinic patients regardless of comorbidities. It's known that hepatitis C antibodies may not become um, detectable in patients with advanced HIV infection, uh, hemodialysis, or other immunocompromising conditions, even when chronic hepatitis C infection is present. Um, acute infections would have also been missed with the uh, screening cascade. So subjects with a greater likelihood of false negative antibody testing may have been missed without simultaneously, simultaneous RNA testing. So uh, patients who presented to the SCD clinic um, in the study were ultimately screened for infection based on a provider's judgment under the guidance of existing risk-based screening recommendations. The most uh, pertinent result perhaps was that 29% of the antibody positive uh, subjects lacked apparent indications for hepatitis C screening that were recommended by both CDC and USPSTF recommendations. Um, this table shows uh, univariate logistic regression analysis in the subpopulation of subjects without injection drug use or birth cohort risk factors. HIV infection, partner injection drug use, and reporting being um, MSM were not found to be associated with being antibody positive. Additionally, 69% of the antibody positive subjects in the study population reported being unaware of having a history of hepatitis C infection. Um, and as shown in this table, being born uh, during 1945 to 1965 was found basically to be the only characteristic that had a significant and positive association with being aware of hepatitis C infection in uh, univariate analysis. And so I thought this might have been a reflection of uh, previous public health actions that have focused on testing um, baby boomers. Um, regarding the limitations of the study, um, I thought there were uh, I mean, several, uh, perhaps one of the biggest being a lack of a representative sample um, and uh, the fact the study population really cannot be compared easily to the general public or even the STD clinic's general population since the patients who presented were not universally screened for hepatitis C infection, but according to uh, provider choice. Um, the burden of hepatitis C infection in the population can also therefore not be extrapolated um, and then due to the use of risk-based screening recommendations uh, last year, there may have been limited sample sizes from high risk, for high-risk groups that were not included in, in the previous recommendations. But um, in spite of the limitations, I think that um, the results of my study exposed really important areas for improvement in national and local efforts towards uh, hepatitis C elimination, notably the absence of major indications for screening in nearly 30% of antibody positive subjects, uh, strongly supporting universal screening recommendations. Also, uh, I think the results suggest that using self-reported risk factors, again, is an insensitive method of detection. And while awareness was found to be abysmal, consistent with other studies, uh, awareness actually has been identified as the single most important predictor for receiving hepatitis C uh, treatment. So about three months after I completed my analysis, and while COVID-19 was increasingly dominating national news, um, the USPSTF in uh, March of 2020 and then the CDC later in, in April issued what I think are monumental recommendations, new recommendations for hepatitis C screening, uh, universal one-time screening of infection in all adults regardless of known risk factors. This is a significant departure from uh, previous guidelines. And then based on the data that the rate of hepatitis C infection among young pregnant women actually increased by more than 200% <clears throat> um, in some states, uh, CDC also included new recommendations for screening of pregnant women with every new pregnancy uh, in April of 2020. So um, identifying infection during prenatal care would allow for um, assessment of the mother's liver disease status and facilitate linkage to care after delivery and also screening um, of exposed infants. And then repeat screening is also recommended for individuals with ongoing risk factors for reinfection, um, injection drug use being the strongest risk factor for reinfection, but the intervals are not specified. So importantly, the USPSTF um, uh, issued recommendations um, that are gonna impact <clears throat> coverage for testing 
So uh, Medication expand Medicaid expansion states and most private health insurance companies will be required to cover hepatitis C screening without cost sharing uh, beginning one year from the date uh, that the most recent USPSTF recommendation was issued. So that would be March uh, 2nd of 2021. Another takeaway, um, I think, is that while universal screening is undoubtedly a crucial first step towards elimination, um, my small study, I think, is kind of a reminder that we cannot truly achieve elimination if the universal screening practices ignore the populations with the highest burden of infection. Um, so persons with ongoing substance use, uh, persons who are homeless and have a history of incarceration, who are actually most likely, or least likely, excuse me, to be engaged in primary care and non-emergent medical care where they might actually get screened. So uh, after screening, linkage to care and retention in care for hepatitis C infection has also been found to be notoriously poor. So an estimated 13 to 18% of persons with chronic hepatitis C infection currently receive treatment, and only 9% of people with chronic hepatitis C infection are estimated to achieve uh, cure. So uh, one of the things that um, you know, I concluded is that it might be that publicly funded clinics, such as the county public health clinics, which routinely provide care for um, under or uninsured populations, um, they might be serving as the most crucial access points for persons who are at the greatest risk, actually, of having hepatitis C infection, uh, hepatitis C reinfection, and also the severe complications of infection. And having integrated hepatitis services within the public health clinics, homeless clinics, substance use disorder treatment, uh, correctional health um, is likely, I think, to prove, well, we, this will be studied further, but will likely prove crucial to actual hepatitis C elimination uh, and our accomplishing our goals. Um, there is evidence that uh, integrated models of care, uh, such as these are actually effective in identifying and linking individuals with chronic um, viral hepatitis. And uh, I think going forward, we'll also have more representative data as a result of universal screening uh, about um, the key populations that we need to identify and target uh, for treatment and, and our elimination efforts lo locally and nationally. That's it. Um, I wanted to thank uh, you for your attention and also my mentors, uh, Dr. Stephanie Brodine, uh, Dr. Francesca Torriani, and Dr. Joe Wallen, and Dr. Samantha Tweeten at Public Health Department. Anybody have questions? Thanks so much, Amu. This was was really great. Um, there were a couple of questions in the chat, and I know there are a lot of people involved in Hep C efforts on the chat, so I may try to open it up. But the first question, and I, I think you may have answered it on the slide after it was asked, but I, I will ask it was from um, Nettie Aldis uh, from San Ysidro Health, who who asked uh, if you looked at meth use alone and mm -hmm. not necessarily injection drug use. And as we all know that meth is associated with HIV transmission mm -hmm. uh, and in San Diego, uh, there's very significant use, particularly in the homeless populations. Yeah, it didn't actually turn out to be a independent um, predictor. That's why um, I didn't uh, actually I can go back to the slide. But um, I didn't include it. it. It didn't actually turn out to be. Um, it was injection drug use specifically that wasn't the significant in the univariate logistic regression analysis, which is why I didn't include it in the multivariable. Um, I uh, obviously anyone's allowed to unmute themselves. Um, I was uh, sort of particularly intrigued by the, and, and I hope I got it right, uh, I thought it, you, uh, in this cohort that, you know, MSM was not associated with mm -hmm. uh, antip antibody positivity. Is mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, that being said, though, uh, I, we, I don't think I had a robust sample of the subgroups that have been previously identified for, you know, being at increased risk among men who have sex with men. So I wasn't able to have, um, I didn't have information on PrEP use, for example, which has been uh, associated, like MSM specifically on PrEP have been associated. And that's why that re population is recommended per uh, CDC as of 2017 to have a screening done. 
Um, I also didn't have subgroups with specific behavioral risk factors other than unprotected um, you know, anal sex. So chem sex wasn't included on there. Um, uh, intranas so other types of non-injection drug use were not included on there as well. So I, there's other variables that could have been missing. Right. Um, I just to the to the point about the MSM uh, and yes, there have been sub signals, uh, but they've actually been fairly limited and I think not as well seen in in the United States. There was you know a big cohort in Amsterdam which showed right. an increased risk, uh, and that's probably what you what you cited yeah. there. Yeah. Um, I was hoping Sheldon Morris was on the call, but I don't believe he is because I was not involved in the manuscript. But they just. Um, he and some colleagues from Los Angeles just submitted um, a manuscript of over 700 MSM taking prep, uh, and they looked at uh, Hep C incidents, and it was zero. Uh, and this was, you know, an early study of sort of you know early adopters to prep. Um, but uh, you know, in our own patient population for for prep users, and we can get off of prep in a second. We've really not seen this signal. Um, I'm, I like that we're still looking for it, but it's interesting that at least right now the data doesn't seem to bear out uh, mm -hmm. anything, uh, you know, other than what was seen in Europe. And I'd be curious if there's anyone else on the call or Amu, if you have thoughts about that. Well, that's um, actually it was explicitly stated in the 2015 um, CDC recommendations for hepatitis C screening that there's insufficient evidence to recommend like screening specifically in MSM. Um, and, and then it was modified with, to include people who are using PrEP, uh, I believe, in 2017. Anyone else want to unmute or you're getting a lot of great talks, <laughs> conversa uh, comments? I know you can't see the chat. Um, but does anyone else have anything else they'd like to make comments about? Um, Nettie did just put something in the chat, um, and I'm not sure if this is the best group to answer this, Nettie, but I'll put it out there. Um, what are others doing in practice for MSM um, who are HIV negative who are not on PrEP? Um, are they just doing one screening? Um, and Davy just wrote, continued hep C screening in HIV negative MSM at least yearly. Um, I, again, I, I, I think these are recommendations based not, on not much data, um, but okay, good. It looks like everyone's, <laughs> what people are saying are yearly screening or based on risk, which would then be the same thing as what's happening for PrEP. Um, so it sounds like it's very similar. Um, I don't know if anyone else cares to unmute themselves. <laughs> it looks like no. I, and that was, Amu, that was your takeaway as well, right? Just the, the yearly screening for, for yearly screening for MSMs, not on prep. Well, technically now everybody and then depending upon risk factors, but I think it's, it's yeah. <laughs> risk factors include also, un, you know, unprotected sex, so would probably include a lot of people, so. <laughs> Condomless sex, well, right? Condomless that, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is Nettie. That was the part that confused me because like, we don't, you know, everybody, we always see people who have risk factors, but then it yeah. kind of looks like, okay, actually, it's just one-time screening for this population unless you identify a specific risk factor. I don't think any of us would, would do that, but we're all HIV and STD docs, but yeah. What, yeah. what should I tell the primary care docs about that? Davey, I don't know if Davey, you can unmute yourself. You've uh, said a few things about the JAMA guidelines. Uh, yeah, I'm not supposed to talk about them, but uh, yeah, they're, you know, it's a, it's a B rating. Um, and it's basically, if uh, someone endorses MSM, then yearly hepatitis C screening is what's going to be recommended. Um, okay. But it, it's consistent with CDC um, guidelines, but more, uh, other risk factor um, should really should really play into here. Like uh, STI should really trigger a um, clinician to go ahead and get Hep C screening as well. That's usually 
in the continuum where it falls off where primary care is not uh, screening for hep C. Well, and that's where I might say, you know, when we see STI, I think what it's starting to trigger for more people, I hope, is, you know, consideration of PrEP. And then once you're considering PrEP, sort of part of that bundle is the yearly hep C screening. Um, but obviously we can take PrEP out of this, um, but it would seem like there is a lot of overlap in all of these behaviors, you know, and, and that's why it, it sort of is a bundled package of what you're discussing with patients, what you're offering, what you're screening them for. But this is Francesca, uh, but uh, if, you, if you have an STI, right, that should prompt screening, not just screening once a year. It, that, that's correct. Sorry if I misspoke, but yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, but that is where people fall off. That's where providers fall off the uh, hep C screening is that they're not triggering the hep C, not including hep C in there. STIs uh, after they do their after they find somebody with an STI. Mm -hmm. And this it actually might be interesting to look at because I think it's uh, a part of our practice and probably at, at the Owen Clinic and probably at a lot of the other STD HIV focused uh, clinics to do yearly Hep C screening for individuals on prep. But we do have a nice we have some data on. Prep patients at UCSD, and I would, uh, I would guess that there is lower Hep C screening in that group, and it's probably uh, some education that's required. Yeah, I, I just think of it like voting. You should do it often and early. <laughs> <laughs> but you're preaching to the the choir, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whoever listens, that's who I preach to. Right. <laughs> Well, thanks. And Amu, um, really, thank you for this great talk. I, I think we, we all really like getting into the hep C data, and it's, it's nice to know that the, that the guidelines you know, are evolving and including more populations. Uh, so thanks for, for giving this and sharing your data um, with us and to more high rounds with you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um... Amu, for this, it, it was a great journey and, and a great project. I do want to bring to the attention of the audience also the new hep C blood-borne pathogen workup uh, guidelines that uh, include now for the source uh, hep C viral load and not uh, antibody that is then um, tiered to, if positive, to uh, a PCR. So right now the recommendation is the source gets uh, tested with a, PC, with a hep C PCR and then the exposed gets tested with um, an antibody and uh, that, that is then um, deflected to a, to a PCR if negative, if, if, uh, if positive, sorry. Thanks, Francesca. Okay, well, thank you everybody. Uh, and we'll, we'll see you next week uh, with Dr. Martin Honegel. Thanks. Have a good day and afternoon and weekend. Bye.